Hi everyone, how are you today? In this video, I'm going to be reading The Hound of Heaven by Francis Thompson. This is a religious poem, just a heads up if that's not your cup of tea, but I think the language is really beautiful and um, I'm going to talk about some of the words he uses and the imagery after I read it. First, I, I will say this is a famous Catholic poem. I didn't actually come across it through Catholicism. I was actually listening to a song by a band called Towers, and they have a song called Two Sparrows. And in the lyrics to Two Sparrows, it says, um, If Corinna's sails stand still, the fields shake and flowers shrill, and the trees your mother's arms, the hound of Zion seeks your heart and calls for you. So I was really taken by that phrase, the hound of Zion, and I didn't know where they got that from. Um, I thought maybe it's from the Bible, but it's actually not. It's from this poem by Francis Thompson. So without further ado, let's read the poem and uh, talk about it afterwards. The Hound of Heaven I fled him down the nights and down the days. I fled him down the arches of the years. I fled him down the labyrinthine ways of my own mind. And in the mist of tears I hid from him, and under running laughter, up vistaed hopes I sped, and shot precipitated, adown titanic glooms of chasmed fears, from those strong feet that followed, followed after. But with unhurrying chase and unperturbed pace, deliberate speed, majestic instancy, they beat, and a voice beat more instant than the feet, all things betray thee, who betrayest to me. I pleaded, outlaw-wise, by many a hearted casement curtained red, trellised with intertwining charities, for though I knew his love who followed, yet was I sore adread, lest, having him, I must have naught beside. But if one little casement parted wide, the gust of his approach would clash it too. Fear wist not to evade, as love wist to pursue. Across the margin of the world I fled, and troubled the gold gateways of the stars, smiting for shelter on their clanged bars, fretted to dulcet jars, and silver and chatter the pale ports of the moon. I said to dawn, be sudden, to eve, be soon. With thy young skyey blossoms heap me o'er, from this tremendous lover, float thy vague veil about me lest he see, I tempted all his servitors but to find my own betrayal in their constancy, in faith to him, their fickleness to me, their traitorous trueness and their loyal deceit. To all swift things for swiftness did I sue, clung to the whistling mane of every wind. But whether they swept smoothly fleet the long savannas of the blue, or whether thunder-driven they clanged his chariot thwart a heaven, Plashy with flying lightnings round the spurn of their feet, fear wist not to evade, as love wist to pursue. Still with unhurrying chase, an unperturbed pace, deliberate speed, majestic instancy, came on the following feet, and a voice above their beat, Naught shelters thee, who will not shelter me. I sought no more that after which I strayed, in face of man or maid, but still within the little children's eyes seems something, something, that replies, They at least are for me, surely for me. I turned me to them very wistfully. But just as their young eyes grew sudden fair with dawning answers there, their angel plucked them from me by the hair. Come then, ye other children, natures, share with me, said I, your delicate fellowship. Let me greet you lip to lip, let me twine with you caresses, wantoning, with Our Lady Mother's vagrant tresses, banqueting, with her in her wind-walled palace, underneath her azure dais, quaffing as your taintless way is from a chalice, lucent weeping out of the day-spring. So it was done. I in their delicate fellowship was one, drew the bolt of nature's secrecies. I knew all the swift importings on the willful face of skies. I knew how the clouds arise, spumet of the wild sea snortings, all that's born or dies, rose and drooped with, made them shapers of mine own moods, or wailful or divine, 
with them joyed and was bereaven, I was heavy with the even, when she lit her glimmering tapers round the day's dead sanctities. I laughed in the morning's eyes. I triumphed, and I saddened with all weather. Heaven and I wept together, and its sweet tears were salt with mortal mine against the red throb of its sunset heart. I laid my own to beat, and share a commingling heat. But not by that, by that was eased my human smart. In vain my tears were wet on heaven's gray cheek, for all we know not what each other says. These things and I, in sound, I speak. Their sound is but their stir. They speak by silences. Nature, poor stepdame, cannot slake my drouth. Let her, if she would owe me, drop yon blue bosom veil of sky and show me the breasts or tenderness. Never did any milk of hers once bless my thirsting mouth. Nigh and nigh draws the chase with unperturbed pace, deliberate speed, majestic instancy, and past those noised feet a voice comes yet more fleet. Lo, not contents thee, who contentst not me. Naked I wait thy love's uplifted stroke, my harness piece by piece thou hast hewn from me, and smitten me to my knee. I am defenseless utterly, I slept methinks and woke and slowly gazing find me stripped in sleep in the rash lusty head of my young powers i shook the pillaring hours and pull my life upon me grimed with smears i stand amid the dust of the mounded years my mangled youth lies dead beneath the heap my days have crackled and gone up in smoke have puffed and burst as sun starts on a stream yea faileth now even dream the dreamer and the lute the lutenist even the linked fantasies in whose blossomy twist I swung the earth a trinket at my wrist, are yielding cords of all too weak account for earth with heavy griefs so overplussed. Ah, is thy love indeed a weed, albeit an amaranthine weed, suffering no flowers except its own to mount? Ah, must designer infinite, ah, must thou char the wood ere thou canst limb with it, my freshness spent its wavering shower in the dust, and now my heart is as a broken fount, wherein tear drippings stagnate, spilt down ever from the dank thoughts that shiver upon the sifal branches of my mind. Such is what is to be. The pulp so bitter, how shall taste the rind? I dimly guess what time in mists confounds. Yet ever and anon a trumpet sounds from the hid battlements of eternity, those shaken mists a space unsettle, then round the half-glimpsed turrets slowly wash again. But not ere him who summoneth I first have seen and wound, with glooming robes purpureal cypress crowned. His name I know, and what his trumpet saith, whether man's heart or life it be which yields the harvest. Must thy harvest fields be dunged with rotten death? Now of that long pursuit comes on at hand the bruit, That voice is round me like a bursting sea, And is thy earth so marred, shatter and shard on shard? Lo, all things fly thee, for thou fliest me, Strange, piteous, futile thing, Wherefore should any set thee love apart, Seeing none but I makes much of naught, he said. And human love needs human meriting. How hast thou merited, of all man's clotted clay, the dingiest clot? Alack, thou knowest not how little worthy of any love thou art. Whom wilt thou find to love ignoble thee? Save me, save only me. All which I took from thee I did but take, not for thy harms, but just that thou mightst seek it in my arms, all which thy child's mistake fancies is lost, I have stored for thee at home. Rise, clasp my hand, and come. Halts by me that footfall. Is my gloom, after all, shade of his hand, outstretched caressingly? Ah, fondest, blindest, weakest, I am he whom thou seekest. Thou dravest love from thee, who dravest me. So that was The Hound of Heaven by Francis Thompson. I will link you some information to Francis Thompson in the description if you want to know about his life and the kind of struggles he was going through as he wrote this poem. 
And uh, what I do want to go over a little bit is some of the language of the poem because obviously there's some words that aren't used anymore or some uh, grammatical structure that might be unfamiliar to us. So I'll also link to my sources in the description because I don't just know this stuff. I had to go look it up myself as well. Um, but yeah, so first part here, it's describing um, the Hound of Heaven um, chasing the narrator. And uh, this part's pretty, pretty self-explanatory. Um, he describes his efforts to escape the Hound of Heaven, trying to find escape in other things, in other pursuits. And uh, further down, it talks about nature's children, so trying to find um, escape in nature, right, in, in creation. And um, even that, however, proves to be fruitless. So there's actually a version of this poem online which has uh, basically the glossary built into the poem. And I would recommend reading this if you um, want to look things up as you go. So, for example, the word margin means like margins or the boundaries, the limits, um, servitors, servants, kind of, that one's kind of more obvious. Um, wist, this line that keeps coming up over and over, fear wist not to evade as love wist to pursue. In this sentence, it means no. So fear doesn't know how to evade as well as love knows how to pursue. Some of these other ones are a little more obvious. Tresses, like hair, tresses of hair. Um, yeah, so it's a little bit difficult to read this the first time, I thought, so it took me actually a few readings before I kind of understood the poem. Um, but really, it's just an iteration of the pursuit of the Hound of Heaven, God's love, God searching out like the lost lamb, and um, the narrator, Francis Thompson, trying to escape, um, but ultimately being overcome by God's love. I'm not going to get into any theological discussions here, but it is a very uh, highly emotional poem, and you can really understand the reader's or the narrator's struggle. And I think what really is key to this is, you know, I think in the back of his mind, he he always knows he's going to go back, right? So, even though, he's like very self-aware that he's trying to escape, right? It's not as if this is something happening in the background and then, you know, it's not a sense of fate. It's more of like, you know, something that he has to come towards eventually. But, you know, he's just aware that this process is happening and and will overtake him eventually because he wants it deep down inside. Like, that's that's kind of my take on this. Um, let's see here. Yeah, so like the very last line, thou dravest love from thee who dravest me. So this really means um, thou, thou drove love from thee who dravest me. So he's saying because you drove he, the narrator drove God out of his heart, then he was really driving love away from himself. So that was kind of the, uh, kind of the key to this whole story. So there is an element of free will in this poem, even though the poem does also represent the image of the shepherd looking for the lost lamb, except in this, in this setting, uh, Thompson has taken a more aggressive, uh, analogy with the hound and the hare, right? The hunting analogy, which is kind of uh, kind of interesting. It seems quintessentially British to me. Um, but anyway, this poem did influence Chesterton and Tolkien, um, two very famous Catholic uh, authors of the 20th century. Um, yeah, I have to say this poem has really stuck with me. I first came across it in 2018. 
And I think it gets better as you read it multiple times. I think at first it's a bit esoteric, a little bit difficult to read. And the analogy is perhaps a bit in your face. But I think as you revisit it and, you know, really try to delve into the language that he's using and understand what it meant in 1909, it really is quite a beautiful poem and I can see how it inspired Tolkien and Chesterton. That's all I had for this video. Thanks for watching. Please like the video if you enjoyed it, and I'll see you next time.